Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for January um, 25th, uh, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. Uh, more information about uh, Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is CI tokens, Federated Authorization for Distributed Scientific Computing. And our presenters are Jim Basney, a Principal Research Scientist at NCSA Cybersecurity Division, uh, Brian Bockelman, an investigator at um, Morgridge Institute for Research, and Derek Weitzel, uh, a Research Assistant Professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Uh, click on the chat icon and type your question in there and we'll take uh, questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand things over to Jim. Thanks, Jeanette. I will start sharing my screen. Great, you should see my title slide there. So, um, hi everyone. I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to give an update from the Side Tokens project. Um, and we do really hope for an interactive session. So, uh, so please keep the, the questions and comments coming in the chat. Um, we've got three presenters today. So while one of us is talking, the other two are available to, um, to answer questions and, and keep the discussion going in the chat. If, if you um, make sure to select in the chat to send your message to all panelists and attendees, then also the, the attendees will see it and that, that makes for a better discussion. So uh, the Site Tokens project is a collaboration uh, across Illinois, Nebraska, Syracuse, and Wisconsin. And uh, we uh, gave an update on the Site Tokens project at the 2019 NSF Cybersecurity Summit in San Diego, which seems like a long time ago now, but uh, that was a very nice meeting. That was um, Alex and Derek gave that presentation. And so today we'll be giving an update with uh, new, some new demos and um, some other uh, community updates. So, um, so as Jeanette said, um, uh, uh, besides me, um, we'll also hear from Derek Weitzel and Brian Bachman. And uh, of course, we, uh, we thank very much the National Science Foundation for supporting our work. The SciTokens project aims to introduce a capabilities-based authorization infrastructure for distributed scientific computing. And we've done this by implementing a reference platform that combines the CI log on HD Condor, CVMFS, and XRootD products to demonstrate the use of capability-based authorization for, uh, for, for uh, scientific workflows. And uh, we are, have been working with uh, specific science use cases and science stakeholders to implement their specific use cases to demonstrate the benefits of capabilities-based authorization. So we've got a couple of motivations for why we think capabilities are the right way to go for our scientific cyber infrastructure going forward. And one is that the world already uses capabilities and they have a lot of, that brings a lot of benefits. Um, uh, first, it's uh, because capabilities are widely used through the OAuth 2 protocol, uh, users are now familiar with them. They're familiar with a consent screen that shows a service asking for specific, uh, specific uh, rights to access resources. And, and then that consent screen is really key because it's showing that um, you're, you're granting um, a, a least privileged set of rights. Uh, a, you're granting only the rights that that service needs to uh, perform its work rather than um, giving the service your password, for example, or, or a credential that allows the service to do anything that you can do. And so that, that least privilege aspect of capabilities is really key. And, and then in addition to uh, users being familiar now with this type of flow through OAuth 2 that, that uh, services, uh, you know, Facebook, Google, Dropbox, et cetera, are using, it also means that there's really good support for OAuth and capabilities in software today. So we're not uh, putting scientific cyber infrastructure into a corner with its own unique security software that you know, relies on um, uh, you know, our, our small community to maintain, but we're, um, we're benefiting from the wider internet community and uh, doing a lot of good security work related to distributed authorization. 
And that, uh, that includes a lot of good work in the ITF on standards using this type of distributed authorization. And so these standards give us guidance on how to use capabilities securely and uh, give us a uh, framework so that we can have good interoperability and, uh, and uh, a, a good path forward. So SciTokens builds on a number of these standards, OAuth 2.0 being a big one that, that gives us a protocol for requesting capability tokens, for having that consent screen where the, uh, where the researcher is um, asked, if, is it okay to issue a capability for this workflow? And also supports token refresh for the long-lived workflows that we see in scientific computing. The JSON Web Token standard gives us self-describing tokens. Um, these are a really uh, a nice um, uh, 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 alternative to opaque tokens uh, because the accepting service can inspect them directly, doesn't require a callback to the token issuer. Instead, we can do distributed validation in our distributed computing environments that, that are so important to our, our scientific computing. The OAuth authorization server metadata standard is really essential for publishing signing keys so you can verify those tokens and also publishing the associated policies and, and URLs associated with um, token issuers. And then the token exchange standard helps us uh, implement that least privilege uh, uh, capabilities more effectively because you can take a token uh, that has a number of privileges and then when you come to a point in the workflow where a subset of those privileges are needed, you can exchange it. You can exchange your current token for a token with a fewer privileges. You can drop privileges through that token exchange endpoint. And then uh, lastly, uh, we see that there's currently an internet draft uh, that gives a profile for using JSON web tokens with the OAuth protocol, exactly as we've been doing inside tokens. So it's another sign that, that there's a lot of good community support for, um, for this approach. So here is an example of how we've implemented the SciTokens model using Condor. And so in this case, um, you can see the, the user makes a submission to Condor with Condor submit. And Condor decides that this job needs, uh, needs a token, needs capabilities to access data. And so Condor submit tells the user, uh, visit this URL because we need to request, we need to do an OAuth request for tokens. So this sends the user to the Condor CredD, which displays the URL. The user clicks that URL and that redirects them to the token server. The user needs to authenticate to the token server. So that token server redirects them to an identity provider, maybe an in-common identity provider. After they authenticate there, the user is redirected back to the token server, which consults its policy database, maybe um, what groups the user is a member of in the scientific collaboration and uh, what specific privileges the user is requesting for this job. And that results then in the token server issuing the token back to the Condor CredD along with a, a refresh token. So that when the Condor CredD sends the job along with the access token so that the job can access uh, data as it's running, if that access token is nearing expiration, the Condor CredD can do the OAuth refresh with the refresh token to get a new access token and send that along. So this is the, uh, the full featured model that we've, uh, we've implemented for side tokens, but we've also found it really val valuable to have a simpler model in some scenarios that we call the local issuer model. And uh, so uh, in the two demos you'll see today, uh, Brian Bachelman will show the, um, the OAuth, an OAuth example, and um, Derek Weitzel will show a local issuer example. So in this case, Condor Credit itself can have a private key to issue tokens based on a local policy on the submit node, and so then that generates an access token that can be sent along with the job so that the, the job can access data. And so in that case, since Condor Credit itself is generating the access tokens, if the token nears expiration, it can just generate another one directly. No need for refresh tokens in that case. SciTokens is implemented uh, by uh, a number of open source software packages, including Python, C++, and, and Java. Uh, from the SciTokens project. Uh, we also have the HD Condor Credmon, which supports SciTokens, and the Exceeds OAuth SSH, which um, now all supports uh, the SciTokens as an authentication method. Additionally, we have four examples of integrating SciTokens 
uh, for um, authorization to, to data, CBMFS, Dcash, Nginx, and XrootD. And um, in two of the cases you see, um, well, in CVMFS, that, uh, that capability has already been added to, uh, to upstream to the CVF CVMFS contrib directory. And in the Dcash example, it's the Dcash developers that implemented the Psy tokens um, support themselves. So it's nice to see uh, an independent interoperable implementation there. We can uh, connect Psy tokens with federated authentication, such as with CI logon, so that when the user authenticates with the incumbent identity provider, they, um, that information about the user and the project memberships in the scientific collaboration can be input to issuance of the Psy token. So this is a combination of authentication protocol like OpenID Connect and authorization protocol like OAuth2. And uh, because of this nice combination, we've now added supports support for site token issuance in the CI logon IAM as a service platform where we can issue based on the federated identity, groups and roles in co-manage and LDAP, authorization policies per client and the, the runtime request and, and approval. And so you can see more details about that uh, CI logon service offering at the CI logon website. The recent TAG PMA workshop on token-based authentication and authorization was, uh, was a really great event bringing together WLCG, Globus, LIGO, Exceed, and Fermilab, demonstrating that these infrastructures are transitioning from X509 user proxy certificates to OAuth and, and JSON web tokens. And, uh, and so it was, it was really valuable to show that community buy-in to the token concept and discuss some of the interoperability challenges and some next steps, including scheduling follow-on workshops, um, making, making sure to, that our JWT profiles are uh, consistent and um, doing feature interop testing. We also think a lot about the threat model for moving to a token-based authorization infrastructure. And I know the, the trusted CI community is, um, is always very interested in threat models. And so we're concerned about threats like credential exposure, granting too much access, threat of a malicious client and authorization of the issuer. And so the, um, the JWT and OAuth standards give us good mitigations for these threats with short lifetimes, token revocation, least privilege delegation, um, good uh, per client management, per client policies, and um, good uh, key rollover and revocation via the metadata. We've got two good RFCs there that talk about um, uh, OAuth threat models and um, JSON uh, token best practices. And another way of thinking about our threat model is to use Trusted CI's OSCRP. And so we have here an example where credential exposure, tokens with too much privileges, malicious client can impact uh, loss of uh, 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 loss of um, uh, loss of effort for reproducing data, uh, incorrect science results, uh, reputation loss, etc. And so these um, this illustrates why the cybersecurity risks impact the scientific productivity of our collaborations and so are important for us to, um, to address in our infrastructures. That is my quick introduction to the current state of Psy tokens, and now I'll hand the screen over to Derek. Thank you, Jim. So I'm gonna give a, uh, a quick demo uh, or and a quick explanation of uh, the OSGs and LIGO's motivation for switching. So GSI and GraphTP were always kind of niche, uh, but even more so now, um, the reference implementations were abandoned by developers. And the internet community has certainly moved on to tokens as, and OAuth, as Jim have, has just explained. So a side token is a JSON web token. And here is an actual example of a, uh, a real life side token. Um, this is uh, available at, at a website. You can make your own tokens, uh, demo.sidetokens.org. And what it, it'll describe uh, how a JSON web token is encoded, how it, uh, what it actually looks like, the payload information, um, including uh, important attributes such as the scope, which will tell you what can actually be, what this JSON web token can actually be used for, um, audience, where it can be used. Um, and then the issuer is also very important. That's 
it, usually a URL to uh, a place that can be down, the public keys can be downloaded to verify the token. So a few of the technologies used in the demo and in the OSG and LIGO, um, HD Condor is used to create, renew, and transfer the side token from the submit host to the execute host. CBMFest is used to authorize the user on the execute machine and cache the data locally. And then finally, XRD is used to manage the regional caches and origins and to authorize access by, the by using the side token. And so this is the flow of the token through a, uh, a LIGO job that's using CBMFS. So you can see on the submit host, the cred mon creates it, and the token is transferred to the job, to the worker node with the job. This uh, of course implies that if you can submit jobs on the submit host, then you have access to LIGO data. Now, when the job has this token, it will use it uh, to access CBMFS, which does a token verification locally. Uh, because th this is a distributed verification, uh, using public and private keys. Uh, it can easily download the public keys and verify the token on the worker node. And then uh, the token is propagated to the cache, which also does its own verification. And if this is the first download of that particular file or that particular data, then it, uh, the token is then propagated once again to the XRD origin where the token is once again verified. And so you can see that it's verified at multiple steps. Like I said, CBMFS, uh, the cache server, and the origin server, but the origin only on the first download. All right, so I will go ahead and start the demo. Um, there's a blizzard here in Lincoln, so I'm hoping that I don't lose internet or the test bed doesn't go down for whatever reason. Okay, so you should be able to see my terminal now. And what I'll show you is that there's a simple submit file a uh, simple Condor submit file. Uh, there's nothing particularly uh, side token specific in the submit file. Uh, the way that it's uh, set up on the OSG and on, in LIGO is that every job automatically gets a token, whether they use it or not is, for, is in that jobs, uh, uh, is the job of the job. And so uh, this is a very standard Condor jo job. If I submit it, it will go and run on the test bed. Now, like any good baking show, I already have uh, the output ready. It will take a minute or two for the job to actually run. So I already have the output ready. Uh, what we're looking for is this execute script. So what it should do is it should uh, list the Condor credentials that are available. It, it will convert the token uh, which doesn't provide any output. It will uh, list the CBMFS LIGO directory, which without a token available in your environment is uh, should return a permission denied. And then finally, it'll check some one of the files in, uh, and that will cause the actual download through the origin to the cache, and then finally to, to the worker node itself. For example, if I was to list the LIGO directory right now, it should give me a permission denied. I don't have a token currently in my environment the job will have a token in its environment. So if I look at the output of a uh, of this job, what you'll see is first, it lists the direct, what the tokens that are available. It cats the token. You'll see it's a JSON uh, with the actual token inside of the JSON. Uh, it'll show the top level directory, which this is the top level directory of LIGO uh, of the LIGO CMFS repo. And then finally, it'll check some one of them. And this, uh, this tests whether it can actually download the entire file. And uh, since it provided a checksum, it, it's, uh, it was able to download the entire file. Okay, I'll go, ahead back, go back to the slides where I summarize the demo. So in this example script that I showed, it will uh, list the credentials directory, convert the token because Ishikander outputs a JSON uh, with, that, with the actual Psi token as one of the members. Then it'll check some of the files. What you saw is it listed the 
uh, credential, the SciToken.use. It catted the credential and you'll see that the token is just is inside the JSON. Uh, it listed the top level directory of the LIGO CVMFS directory, and then it uh, checksummed one of the files. And of course, CVMFS used authenticated caching in order to do the listing and then also the checksum. And this is the actual side token that was used in the ready-made uh, demo. Um, and so you can you can see this, you can create your own tokens at demo.sidetokens, but this one was issued by an actual issuer, not by the demo issuer. And so what you'll notice is it's uh, the algorithm and the key ID up here is useful for the uh, for decoding the token and also for verifying it. And then it, the uh, actual payload, you'll notice that audience is set to any, which is a special value. Uh, because this token is propagated and sent to so many servers, uh, that a single audience doesn't really make sense. So it has to be available for uh, to be verified anywhere. The uh, issuer is set to the LIGO issuer. Um, the scope is uh, pretty permissive with reading, uh, but the CVMFS repo, uh, the way CVMFS implements authentication, it's an all or nothing. Uh, so uh, the, the reading is the entire repo. And then uh, it has the normal expiration and issued at dates. So some recent developments, this required the HG Condor OAuth issuer on the submit host, and OSG is the production and the test case. ExtraD 5.0, which was released at the beginning of this year, uh, has built into support for TLS. And additionally, ExtraD integrated site token support into the main repo. So every build of ExtraD now has site tokens built in. Okay, now I'll hand it off to Brian. All right, so uh, like Derek, I am also going to tempt fate and attempt a small demo here. Um, and, and like Derek, the, the test machines are in the middle of Nebraska in, in a blizzard. So uh, everybody uh, say a little prayer for your poor presenter. Uh, but before I get that there, I want to talk a, a little bit about some external groups that we're working with. <clears throat> Excuse me. A, a, in particular, one of the communities we've partnered with uh, is the high energy physics community. And one of the important umbrella organizations that coordinates across uh, international boundaries is, uh, is the WLCG. So we've been working with the WLCG authorization working group. And uh, they've been working uh, also kind of at the international level to help the, that set of the higher energy physics community to transition uh, their authorization infrastructure to use tokens. So of course, uh, US-based projects need to interoperate with the international community, which means that uh, we've been working close uh, both at the policy level and the technology level. Uh, one of the biggest things that the working group has produced so far is kind of a WLCG wide uh, common profile. Uh, this incorporates much of the site tokens ideas and adds a, a few other topics to it. Uh, these are actually sufficiently similar that uh, site tokens, the, the technology, the, the actual C++ library we use on the client side uh, can interoperate with either profiles. So that kind of gives you a le the level of overlap you see between them. And then finally, uh, the WLCG actually uh, or serves as a very important forum uh, where implementers, whether they're implementing uh, storage systems or the ability or some compute infrastructure, or they're Im implementing an actual token issuer itself, uh, users, in this case, the various physics communities, and those who are interested in trying to get everything to interoperate and write down some common understandings or, or standards uh, have the ability to meet. So it's been a, a very uh, useful group to be a part of. As I mentioned, maybe the, the, the biggest thing or the most important to me that they've produced is actual a common profile that everybody has agreed to work on and follow. 
there's the, the DOI I give there, uh, but it's actually all currently developed on GitHub. So if you see issues, if you want to raise or propose some changes, it's, it's kind of using a normal GitHub profile to, to move things forward. Uh, it defines both uh, policies for the group-based authorization and capability-based authorization. If you remember where uh, Jim uh, started, uh, we are mostly working on the capability-based side. So we're really looking at fine-grained aspects. Uh, so other different use cases between identity tokens, access tokens, and groups and authorizations, uh, we're most active and help uh, to find a lot of the pieces for item number three, uh, access tokens with authorization scopes. So if you see over here on the right, uh, this is what a WLCG common token looks like. It looks fairly a lot like a typical JWT if you've ever seen one of these decoded. Uh, maybe the surprising pieces would be uh, a custom claim here declaring it's a WLCG token. Uh, some of these aspects of the scopes, you can see that uh, instead of site tokens, which said read, this says storage.read. And uh, there, there's also a WLCG scope here as well. So there's a lot of overlap and we work together fairly closely. So again, these are close enough that we can actually support the same uh, from one library, these multiple different profiles, uh, which I think kind of goes to, to the, again, the overlap. And the, the CI logon token service, depending on what the client requests, is able to issue tokens using either profile. And uh, as the IETF and other standard setting body really start to dig into this area, uh, we're working on uh, thinking about how we can further harmonize things and decrease the difference between the profiles and I think uh, eventually decrease uh, the difference between what IETF has and what we're working on. Uh, we're developing various guidance on where, how to best use the profiles. And another thing that's been really important is actually just getting everybody together on occasion for technical work uh, to make sure that whether it's different data access uh, or, or different ways that we or generate these tokens, uh, that we make sure that we have interoperability and that the implementations kind of interpret the standards and kind of test against the standards in the same way. Uh, so I include this picture on the right because it reminds me of, of happy days about 12 months ago when I, we could actually go places and sit down and work with people. So one important aspect of the WLCG is almost all of the uh, users are using the command line to do their work. So it's a, a very command line heavy ecosystem. And uh, there's a number of tools that are, must be uh, adapted uh, to, to actually use the token authentication. So there's the obvious ones, you know, file upload and download. Uh, and even things like some of the scientific software that talks directly to endpoints have to be able to, for example, uh, discover the token that is stored in the Unix environment. And so WLCG has been work, uh, thinking about uh, standardizing token discovery rules for how to find uh, token, uh, a bear tokens from the command line. Uh, there's bulk data transfer services where there's a third party service. Uh, we're very clever with naming the WLCG. It's called FTS for file transfer service. Uh, and not only does this require discovery of the tokens, but also the ability to delegate uh, authorizations through this third party service. Uh, and as you can imagine, we're leaning heavily on OAuth here uh, to make sure that part that third party service has the ability to transfer files on behalf of the different organizations. And then, you know, almost through symmetry, there's considerations for uh, the, the job management side as well. How do you submit jobs using tokens? And how do you uh, submit, we, we call these pilots, how do you uh, automate a large scale acquisition of resources using tokens? So in almost any place in a large infrastructure like this that requires authorization, uh, there's some work to understand how this is using uh, largely X509 right now and to put together plans for how it moves forward. So we're happy to work with them on quite a significant project. 
Um, and not only that, but both developers and users need tools to manage their own tokens. So uh, in a number of these cases, maybe a third party service like FTS, like HT Condor will manage the tokens for users. Uh, but there's several cases when you're not using one of those uh, that you still will need access to a token and accessing data directly is a great example. Uh, there's two uh, kind of parallel tracks that are going on here. One that's maybe more oriented to developers and people working independently. Uh, and I'll demo this and we're using a tool called OADC Agent. Uh, another track that Fermilab is working on, and I saw Dave Dykstra's here, and he's really been the, uh, a lot of the force behind it, is using uh, the Vault service from HashiCorp to manage all the secrets and OAuth workflows. Uh, so I think these are both uh, very complementary approaches. So further, uh, one important use case, and as Jim mentioned, we really build on top of this, is the HD Condor software suite. Uh, and there's really two different ways that this gets used. Uh, one, uh, we maybe talk to Condor directly. One example is the Condor CE which is used to accept remote jobs. Uh, and for this, we need to make sure that Condor can talk and authorize, or authenticate and authorize based on site tokens. So it has to understand the format directly. And then the second thing that Condor needs to do is be able to manage job execution. And this includes, as Derek showed, uh, management of whatever tokens or credentials are required uh, for that job execution. Uh, so in this case, Condor must acquire, manage, and you know, some cases, for example, refresh the correct tokens corresponding to jobs. So for token authentication, uh, Condor uh, is built on a, a custom binary protocol uh, that we lovingly refer to as Cedar. And since the beginning, uh, the security handshake has always allowed for multiple authentication protocols. Uh, so last year, support for the site token space protocol was added. And uh, even though it's a binary framework underneath, if you look at the guts, what it's doing is establishing a TLS session to determine the identity of the server. And if the client is happy with the server, uh, the client sends its token it wants to use to authenticate to Condor over the TLS session. And then the server authenticates and makes authorization to decisions based on the contents of the bearer token. Uh, it's not HTTP underneath, but it has a lot of the same themes and ideas. On the token management side, uh, there's a couple pieces and I'll walk kind of step through step of this picture uh, that the command line tools to help manage credentials. And one thing I really like about this Condor setup is uh, it, you know, you'll notice that a lot of the daemons uh, have the word cred, as in credentials in it. And right now, this is not token or JWT specific. So uh, a lot of this work, the idea was to make sure that uh, Condor could handle opaque tokens. We, of course, make sure it works very well or as well as we can, or sorry, opaque credentials. We make sure it works very well on tokens. Uh, but the idea is whatever comes up in the future, the, the world's next greatest thing beyond JWT, uh, hopefully it will work with those credentials as well. So the first of three steps, uh, when a user submits a job or an agent submits a job on behalf of the user, uh, it will talk with a daemon called the CredD, which is kind of the external facing API uh, to interact with the, uh, what I call here repository, but on disk, it's really just a, a directory. So Condor uh, submit, make sure that it looks at the jobs and make sure that any token or any credentials that are needed uh, are available and fresh uh, at the CredD, which of course turns around and checks that directory there in blue. And if successful actually submits the job out to the SCEDD. Now there are two daemons that actually look at the credential repository. The CredD is the external facing API and the CredMon is the the main specific thing that understands tokens. And what this is doing is uh, refreshing things and making sure that uh, all the tokens are, are managed appropriately. Uh, and Derek's example, uh, it signed the token directly. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, 
for OAuth, it's very rarely actually the signer. So Credmon itself acts as the OAuth client and handles the interaction with say uh, Box if you're uh, managing Box tokens. So uh, one thing to note is that the tokens compared to other credential uh, approaches are relatively short-lived. In Derek's example, it was a 20 minute long token. So the Credmon is also in charge and it's fairly active to make sure everything is refreshed and available and ready for jobs. So when the job is launched, uh, the per job agent in Condor's terminology is called the job shadow. And this understands uh, what uh, tokens are needed for the job and when the starter uh, at the bottom of the worker node uh, asks for a particular token, it's able to transfer it uh, uh, for the starter uh, on, on the user's behalf. And this allows us to make sure that at the beginning of the job and we're doing the input uh, management, tokens are always available. For example, the input files come, in, come from a HTTP server that requires auth and this Connection is persistent throughout the job's lifetime to make sure if the job requests it, there's always a valid token during execution. And then finally, on the worker node side, uh, again, this is kind of showing what, what Derek has already talked about. There's a directory on disk that the job can find through environment variable and discover and pick out the token that it's interested in. And in fact, uh, there could be multiple tokens per job if the user needs to access multiple services. So it's worth pointing out, uh, this has been kind of a multi-year development. Uh, for example, the authentication support was added last year during the 8.9 series, as well as a number uh, of the uh, bigger features for the token management. Uh, so this is the 8.9 series, and this will soon be fully supported uh, as a, what Condor refers to as the stable release, or bug fix only releases uh, starting in 9.0, which will come uh, relatively soon. Uh, we've been continuously adding small uh, additional things. This will, you know, for example, uh, we recently added support for local universe jobs. So uh, DAGs, or uh, the Condor workflows can access tokens, and if some job needs to manage file uploads and downloads from the submit point itself, it can do that. And um, you know, we are gonna you know, kind of continue to further develop this and work on it uh, as we gain users and uh, hopefully uh, build bootstrap this thriving community. So now the dicey part. I want to show again uh, a bit about what one of these uh, workflows looks like. So what a developer might do if they want to start using tokens, how this uh, interacts with the command line and the browser, and hopefully can also show uh, a bit what uh, it looks like to authenticate with Condor. So you can see here, first of all, uh, I've set up my Condor uh, access point. So it only will use tokens and I don't have any set up in my environment right now. And so I get a authentication denied. The first thing I do is uh, launch this OIDC agent, uh, which acts and I think purpose, very purposely mimics uh, SSH key agent. So a lot of the same ideas if you've seen that before. Uh, but this is going to manage in the background all the token refresh and make sure that the tokens are always encrypted on disk. Next, I am going to uh, set up a new token endpoint. So I'm going to request a token from the WLCG issuer. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna call this WLCG2 because I've already set up another one just in case of this breaks. And this sets up uh, internal OAuth client, and we'll do a token acquisition flow that we'll see in a second, use something called the device flow. So I'm gonna use uh, the 
WLCG issuer. I hope you guys don't mind I'm copy pasting off screen. I can't type that fast. So OIDC agent just went off and talked to the issuer and see what scopes it supports. Uh, I'm going to request WLCG tokens. I'm going to re request read uh, capability. I'm going to request offline access, which is OAuth terminology for getting a refresh token. Uh, so I don't have to repeat this flow uh, every couple of hours that, that we can automate refresh. All right, so everything's set up and registered, but we're not yet authorized and this is not yet associated my, with my profile. So what I need to do is follow this link. Go over to the instance and I'm gonna sign in under my name. And what this flow is doing, it's associating what I just did on the command line with my identity in the browser. Uh, since it's typically a really bad interface to put in usernames and passwords within the command line. So by entering this code, I'm creating a link between my identity that I've established in the browser and this client, which is up to now anonymous. So this is a traditional consent screen you've probably used, seen before. It's telling me some caution that this is the first time this client came up, which of course I knew that, I just started it. And it's requesting different aspects about me. So we're gonna use WLCG profile. It's gonna use my name associated with the token and it's gonna give me read access to WLCG storage. So I'm gonna hit authorize. We've got our approval. So that's again, the consent screen. I'm gonna give it an encryption password. So I make sure that uh, nothing unencrypted is sitting on disk. And now I'm gonna request a token. So here, uh, if anybody has good enough memory to memorize this, you would be able to get access to read our test endpoints. Uh, sorry, this doesn't get you access to any actual WLCG data. Uh, but this is a JWT, as uh, you might expect. And again, since it's kind of a, a throwaway credential, I'm going to decrypt it. And you can see the different permissions that we asked for. See that is indeed a WLCG token. And you can see here we're actually starting to switch and use uh, anonymized subjects. So WLCG knows that this means Brian Bockelman, but I'm not blasting my name all across the planet. Now here's where this is slightly uh, uh, rough around the edges, but I'm going to uh, save this token to a well-known location. This is using the, oh, sorry, WLCG discovery profile. Uh, so Condor knows to go look inside this temporary directory and this file name for a potential token. And finally, if we we're all lucky, I could type Condor Q and see my name. So that used in the background, uh, the site token's off. And you can see when I did the authorization check, it says I use site tokens and it mapped me because I set this up beforehand to my user account on this host. And with that, it's the end of my short little demo. And I think, uh, Jim, uh, it's up to you to, to close us out. Thanks very much, Brian and Derek. The, the demo gods were smiling on us to have successful demos during a storm. Uh, so we had a, a, a real good discussion in the chat. And um, so, uh, and we've got a few minutes uh, for the recording. I'm going to um, try and summarize the, the, the comments in the chat. So um, we had a question about support for Pegasus. 
and, uh, and Brian did reference some work that um, Duncan Brown at Syracuse has done um, using side tokens with Pegasus. And uh, it's, it's my understanding it didn't require any changes to Pegasus because Pegasus knows how to construct the Condor job submit files and, and, let, um, and uh, let Condor do the credential management. So, um, uh, so I, I do believe we've got uh, successful interoperability with Pegasus workflows. Um, we had a couple comments about the tokens uh, showing up on the screen um, and uh, about the fact that those are bearer tokens. So if you have that token, you could potentially do the things that the token allows you to do. And, and so, of course, uh, so some of the tokens we were showing were expired or they had very restricted um, privileges in the, the tokens. Um, and so that's, but that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, definitely one of the risks about a bearer token um, like uh, JWTs is uh, that you have to protect them from eavesdropping or disclosure. And so like over the network, you need to use some TLS encryption. Um, and uh, we had a question about the audience value. I think at in at least one of our examples, we had an audience value of any. And uh, so that is a token that could potentially be used at any service. And um, so there's definitely some risk associated with that. And uh, I think both the, the OAuth and the JWT security considerations, RFCs have guidance about um, uh, when using these tokens in production, we do want specific audience values to say this token should be used in this environment for, for this specific service. And so that's where when you submit a Condor job that is reading data from particular re, uh, repositories, then it can request a token with that particular audience. Uh, we had some comments about interoperability between WLCG and the side tokens profiles. And, um, and so uh, it was good that we had uh, Hannah Short from WLCG, um, from the WLCG authorization working group in the chat so that uh, from both sides, from the side tokens project, I can say that we really care about interoperability with the WLCG profile and, and we support it in our Python, C++ and Java implementations. And, and likewise, um, Hannah says uh, that the aim for WLCG is to harmonize as, uh, as much as possible. And um, indeed, um, uh, WLCG tokens are effectively uh, side tokens plus some extra, extra data. Um, uh, we had a question about the uh, refresh token lifetimes. Um, and so my response there was that the lifetimes are configurable, but um, we do have guidance from the WLCG profile that uh, token lifetimes are a minimum of one day, recommended lifetime of 10 days, and maximum of 30 days. Um, but uh, it is set by policy that can be per, per client policy. And as I've been talking, um, we uh, Dave asked a question about the, the mapping to Brian's account in uh, Brian's demo. And um, uh, Brian said he uh, used the account mapping uh, using the Condor map file. And, um, and uh, Stuart asked Brian, what happens if you hit deny in the OIDC add command? In that case, it, um, uh, the, the command will fail. You won't get credentials to the, um, uh, to the command line in that case. And we had a question about uh, how the, uh, the jobs get tokens. And um, uh, so I think that I think Brian's answering that one about how um, the tokens are moved by HD Condor from the submit node to, to the worker node, and so that's how the uh, the job has tokens. And when the refresh it's, is done, the refresh is done on the submit side and then moved to the running job. Yeah, Jim, I, I wanted to elaborate that a, a little bit uh, for OSG. Uh, the worker nodes are often. Um, you know, contributed resources from ac across the planet. So there, there might be dozen or, or dozens of different uh, physical locations that are kind of offering up uh, worker node services. So we kind of have less trust and what might be out there on the worker node. And then that's, that's why we end up refreshing on the SCEDD, which we have, we, you know, a place like LIGO or OSG might manage directly and more closely and then only send out this least privileged credential out, out to the worker node. So that, that does look a little different from a typical OAuth flow, but it's done because of this different uh, levels of trust.
And so I think we've got a few more minutes for additional questions in the chat. So please do keep the, the comments and questions coming in and we'll, we'll take those. But uh, let me also give some wrap up information. Um, our homepage is scitokens.org. And so you can visit there for, uh, we'll have uh, these slides posted there and, and the recording and um, our publications and profile details. And of course, links to, um, to GitHub where the, where the software lives. Um, you, uh, you can join our mailing lists. We have a dis discussion mailing list and an announce mailing list. And you're also welcome to contact the three of us directly. And so with that, I think I will let Jeanette take back uh, control of the screen. I think she's got some wrap up comments while we're um, having some more chat. Yes, um, can you see my screen? I believe so. Um, I can, yes, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to co cover a few community updates uh, while people are getting in their last minute questions. Uh, first of all, today uh, we have a webinar at 3 p.m. Eastern that we wanted to, well, it's not our webinar, pardon, but we wanted to promote this webinar. Um, Robert Hainish from NIST is presenting preliminary research data framework um, on the preliminary research data framework, RDAF, if you've heard of it before. Um, let me actually try to post this link in the chat because it's a little cumbersome. And so it's a lot easier for me to just throw it in the chat. There we go. So um, that is the link to, to join that webinar. Um, also, we've got an NSF uh, webinar coming up, the overview of the Secure and Trustworthy uh, Cyberspace SATC program. And that is on Friday, June 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And that URL is here. I'll just throw it in here real quick so that you can pull it up on your browser. And then um, our next webinar, the Trusted CI webinar, is Monday, February 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. And the topic is the CARE Lab Application Research and Education with Anshul Reggae. Um, Anshul is a former Trusted CI Fellows. We've developed a very um, a wonderful relationship with her and her research. She, um, she researches cybercrime um, with a, a very um, strong focus on, on sociology. Um, we are excited to host her next month. So if you're interested in that topic, please uh, join our webinar. And then also we're accepting applications for engagements in the second half of 2021. Um, that, that announcement should be coming out sometime in February. So if you're interested in engaging with Trusted CI, please uh, pay attention to those announcements when they come out. And so with that, I'll see if we have any more follow-up questions that uh, you want to answer, Jim. Uh, we did um, have, uh, let's see. Um, oh, uh, Dave Dijkstra did uh, post some good uh, details about the HashiCorp Vault client that he has been working on that um, adds some nice features to uh, credential management in HD Condor related to OAuth and and um, and bearer tokens like JWTs, so that could be um, so so people can can watch for that in a future um, HD Condor release, or can also follow up with Dave. And um, we have a question about um, the history of the Cedar protocol in HD Condor, and so now we're uh, passing around some links to old HD Condor team pictures from the 1990s, back when that protocol was was implemented. Uh, and I think that might be all in the chat. So, but thanks everyone for your comments and questions and for the opportunity to, to give this presentation. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for presenting and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I could probably throw those photos in the composed slides, by the way, Jim, <laughs> if you like. Um, any last minute comments from our other panelists? Okay. I think with that, um, we'll wrap things up. Thank you again, everybody for um, joining this presentation. I will be uh, posting the slides and the video uh, hopefully later today. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And then also, um, if you have any questions about our webinars uh, or want to give us feedback, you can go to trustedci.org slash webinars, or you can email us at webinars at trustedci.org. And we, we accept feedback, we accept uh, requests to present. So please, uh, please contact us. 
And with that, I think I will wrap things up. Um, Jim and and uh, and Derek and Brian, thank you again for for agreeing to present. And with that, I will uh, end this presentation. Have a good day, everybody.